Gregory Hinton is a California-based author, filmmaker, historian, and lecturer. His work explores LGBTQ themes and how they relate to the community at large. He's a son of Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. He's devoted his energies to a program called Out West, his National Museum Program series offering lectures, films, plays, and gallery exhibitions dedicated to shining a light on LGBTQ history and culture in the American West. He graduated from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He holds a residency at Wyoming's U Cross Foundation, a fellowship at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and is associate editor <laughs> of the papers of William F. Cody. He's a founding director of the Gay and Lesbian Rodeo Heritage Foundation and the 2017 recipient of its Paladin Award. Hinton holds the 2010 International Gay Rodeo Association's President's Award for his Gay Rodeo Legacy Project, serving as Honorary Grand Marshal of the 25th Anniversary of the World Gay Rodeo. Please help me welcome Gregory Hinton. How's everybody doing? Step back from the microphone, sir. Um, I'm uh, so pleased to be back in Tulsa so soon after uh, the warm welcome my community received uh, a couple months ago for Out West After Hours at the Gilcrease. Um, but don't take my word for it. Uh, this is from Toby Jenkins, who's the director of Oklahomans for Equality, who wrote the Gilcrease that the Grand Prairie, Prairie, Prairie Queen herself, Lady Gilcrease, exceeded all my expectations for historic and a landmark night. Thank you for extend, expanding the West narrative and acknowledging the presence of LGBTQ persons. To be excluded is damaging, uh, to be included is healing, to be celebrated is affirming, and Gilcrease Museum celebrated our presence and place in history that night. So I want to thank the Gilcrease again for that wonderful, wonderful evening. And uh, before the Gilcrease, early and continuously in the last 10 years when I started this adventure, the names Alfred Jacob Miller, William Drummond Stewart, and Antoine Clement have floated up in conversation in the collections of the Autry in Los Angeles, the Whitney Gallery of Western Art in Cody, the Idle Jorg Museum in Indianapolis, and the American Heritage Center in Laramie, where I just was last week. Now, the mission of Out West is to shine a light on the history and culture of the LGBT community in the American West. So the very first two books I ordered when I got this idea uh, are referred to the issue of those pesky dancing cowboys. <laughs> so, Cowboys and Cattlemen by Texas scholar uh, Jacqueline M. Moore and Queer Cowboys by NYU professor Chris Packard offer opposing views on gender and identity and how homosexuality can be interpreted in the Old West. In Cowboys and Cattle Men, Moore discusses the bonds which cowboys created to replace those of traditional communities. Their homosocial community did not mirror the rest of society deemed normal. During the work season, other than the rancher's wife or daughters, cowboys had few regular dealings with women. Most men were isolated from town and other people for long periods of time. And Moore then points out that the few places where cowboys were likely to uh, have contact with women was at a dance, where men often outnumbered the women. Uh, and the relative scarcity of women on the ranches meant that most dances were stag affairs and men had to partner with each other. And to coin a cowboy term, not my words, taking the heifer brand was not uncommon and the designee might sport a wrist ornament or an apron and be referred to as she during the evening. Um, in the introduction to queer cowboys, Packard writes that their status as cowboys relies on bachelorhood, not a solitary hermit's isolation, but something formed around a partnership. And this friendship is based upon an unspoken attachment resembling a blood tie and involving loyalty, but not fidelity. Their tales of failure with women justify their emotional attachments to a cowboy outfit, an outfit in which partner shares a bedroll and a string of horses with another. Packer then goes on to cite Badger C. Clark's poem, The Lost Partner, which mourns the loss of long-term partner in language suggested of both spiritual and physical homoeroticism. We loved each other the way men do and never spoke about it, Al and me, but we both knowed and knowing it so true was more than any woman's kiss could be. 
We knowed, and if the way was smooth or rough, the weather shine or poor, while well, I had him, the rest seemed good enough. But he ain't here no more. In her article, Were There Gay Cowboys on the Texas Frontier, Moore writes that the answer is probably, though we will never have documentary proof. Moore then notes that reading homosexual behavior into sentimental poetry, contemporary literature, and photos of men dancing together has become a cottage industry, citing Chris Packard and queer cowboys as an example. In response to Moore's observation that there's complete silence in the documentary evidence, Packard writes, facts like the kind Moore seeks exist in the 1888 sheriff's report from Boot Hill, where he arrested male prostitutes in the house of ill repute. And this is a bit tough. He writes, Moore's claim about silence and the record reproduces the homophobic silences that killed so many pre-Stonewall queers. From 1840, we're on a two-year painting commission in Scotland. The American landscape painter and portraitist Alfred Jacob Miller, in a letter to an intimate friend, Brance Meyer, described his studio at Murthley Castle in Perthshire. I have a delicious little painting room which looks out upon the garden, and when I raise the window in the morning, the birds pour in in perfect flood of song. Now, Murthley Castle was the, est was the estate of Miller's patron, explorer, and nobleman, Sir William Drummond Stewart. In 1842, a young Queen Victoria, on her first visit to Scotland, described Murthley Castle as situated where once stood Burham Wood, as so renowned in Macbeth. She commented on seeing the American buffaloes, which Stewart had sent from America. And she might not see bison again until she visited Buffalo Bill's Wild West in London as part of her Golden Jubilee in 1877. 1887, forgive me. So in June of 1941, in a letter to his brother in Baltimore, Miller noted the appearance of two buffalo chairs, richly carved in mahogany, very curious in the vestibule of Murthley's castle, which is uh, where, obviously, William Drummond Stewart's ancestral home was. And 168 years later, the Los Angeles Times reported that included in the Autry National Center's launch of our LGBT museum, museum program series out west were a pair of ornately carved buffalo chairs from the collection once belonging to Mr. Stewart. And I just paid a call on these chairs the other day. Uh, the Times went on to report of Stewart's original commission of the promising young Baltimore painter Alfred Jacob Miller to accompany him to sketch images from the 1837 Trappers Rendezvous where fur trappers, Indians, and fur company traders such as the American Fur Company gathered at the confluence of the Green River and Horse Creek near today's town of Pinedale, Wyoming. Also accompanying Stewart was Antoine Clement, his trusted uh, matey guide and translator. In her sublime survey, Sentimental Journey, The Art of Alfred Jacob Miller, scholar Lisa Strong notes that Antoine was Stewart's constant companion during his American tours in the Far West. His distinctive facial features, belted jacket, and loose-brimmed hat are recognizable in over a third of Miller's sketches. Now, Miller, is typically depicted, Miller typically depicted uh, Clement as compositionally subservient in terms of Stewart, who is unabashedly staged as a star in any scene in which he appeared. That said, Clement would not have been memorialized so prominently had Stuart not wished it so. So the Times then surprisingly described Clement as Stuart's lover. After the final rendezvous, the two, met, the two moved back to Stuart's castle but arranged for Clement to live as the butler so as not to raise questions. So, soon thereafter, the Autry's Visitor Service Department received an irate email from a great-great-grandniece of Antoine Clement who emphasized that whether or not he was gay was not the issue, but after 40 years of research, no documents or family oral history ever questioned her great uncle's sexual orientation. What was the proof, she asked, or was it just too easy to go after Antoine? So an internal uh, Autry discussion properly observed that we have to be especially careful not to impose 20th century terms and categories on historical subjects when, where that language and those labels has not been socially constructed. And indeed, our hidden histories discussion should acknowledge an appreciation for the presence of diverse sexualities in the Western past, but also as an understanding of how recent a construction are current categories for understanding sexual orientation and identities. So a letter of concern and apology was sent by a consulting Autry historian to Clement's relative, stating that the term used by the newspaper reporter described Stuart and Clement's friendship was, quote, not a term I've ever used, but held fast to Stuart's emotional interest towards men. 
So the last volley from the Clements aggrieved distant cousin posed this question. Since Alfred Jacob Miller too went back to Scotland and at the same time as Antoine for two years to paint from his sketches, why is he not being brought up in the article as being part of the Brokeback Mountain Bunch? Um, I really had to hand it to her. Um, so while uh, queer theory and the word queer is a, is a word I absolutely hate, it's been hurled at my back too many times, but I have to say it for the purposes of this talk, just know I don't like it. While queer theory is focused on possible intimate relations between uh, Stuart and Clement, it does intrigue why, why Miller uh, has escaped serious speculation. He never married, though financially secure enough to build a comf comfortable home in Baltimore sufficient to accommodate four unmarried sisters. Uh, sorry, this is the uh, Gilcrease's painting. And pasted inside his journal was a clipping which read, Michelangelo the painter was asked why he did not marry, and he replied, I've espoused my art, and it occasions me sufficient domestic cares, for my work shall be my children. And this was often what, uh, what unmarried artists would, uh, would, would note when they were asked why they weren't married. Strong observes that artists, clergymen, and teachers were viewed as effeminate because their careers involved nurture and sentiment. And Longfellow complained about the reputation of male writers in a letter to Walt Whitman. Americans hold that the appellation of scholar and man of letters as effeminate and inefficient. Strong holds that Miller's masculinity was doubly imperiled because his subject matter, the trapper, was the paragon of masculinity. His biography suggests that there may have been circumstantial or psychological explanations for his bachelorhood, but what is significant for this argument is that Miller presented itself as a professional choice. So what we kind of see here is we'll go up to the very gate of possibly speculating on sexual orientation, but we always stop. And I'm just going to interject something here. And the concern about going through that door is that it's an offense to suggest that somebody's gay if they're not. It's not just like getting eyes that are green wrong and calling them brown. But this concern about offense and, um, and miscategorizing somebody in that fashion is just something that um, our historians and curators don't generally want to do. So, notes and sketches. Do you see what I see? This is uh, uh, Alfred Jacob Miller's The Lost Greenhorn. It's not in this collection, but it makes a point. Um, the title page of the 1947 Pulitzer Prize-winning history book, Across the Wide Missouri, by Bernard DeVoto, illustrated with paintings by Alfred Jacob Miller, Charles Bodmer, and George Catlin. Bodmer and, Bodmer and Catlin follow Miller, sharing a credit line in smaller fonts. All three very fine painters visited the region during the same period. Catlin five times between 1830 and 1836, Bodmer between 1832 and 34, and Miller for only six months, from 1837 to 38. Devoto credits a Mrs. Clyde Porter of Kansas City for bringing the ne neglected painter Miller to light. In 1935, she visited Baltimore's Peel Museum looking for Western works relating to Lewis and Clark. A secretary pulled out a pasteboard carton of spa sketches, over 100 years old and as fresh in color as the day they were painted. And a year later, May Reed Porter, who eventually wrote the foreword for Across the Wide Missouri, purchased a set, which informs the Gilcrease collection today and Porter made it her life's work to write and lecture about Miller, including her book, Scotsman in Buckskin. Prior to his visit to the far west, convinced of his potential, Miller's father, a successful Baltimore grocer, sent Alfred to Europe in what Strong describes as palpable condescension. Devoto wrote that from 1834 to 1836, Alfred Jacob Miller had nearly uh, two years in, uh, of the brisk wind that was blowing through the studios of Paris and Rome. He talked many nights away with painter Horace Vernet and his young men at many cafes and many ateliers. Miller had traveled to Rome with acclaimed author, poet, and editor Nathaniel Parker Willis, who, striking at six feet tall, was described through the years respectively as an invert by his own sister, effeminate, a dandy, guilty of Miss Nancyism, and an anticipation of Oscar Wilde. Um, so while traveling with Willis, Miller had been arrested at the Italian frontier where his copies at the Louvre had been mistaken uh, for originals. And in Rome, he had discussed the beautiful with all the young men, and he had made an impression too in Paris where they called him the American Raphael. So returning home, Miller's patron father, father decided, died suddenly and was discovered to be badly in debt. So in the spring of 1837, Alfred Jacob Miller found himself in a Charter Street studio in New Orleans where he relocated with only 30 bucks in his pocket. 
Miller was working on a large oil painting of a Baltimore evening sky when a man entered his studio who possessed a military air. And after commenting that he liked the management of the picture and the view, the gentleman departed, but returned several days later and offered Miller his card. Captain William Drummond Stewart of the British Army was seeking a competent artist to accompany him to the far west, which he had visited four times. Looking for a draftsman to sketch the remarkable senior, scenery and the incidents, Stewart offered Miller the job and provided him with several references. After good reports, Miller visited the lodgings of Stewart, who was playing cards with that wild child of the prairie, Antoine Clement, his, uh, his guide and companion, who was also described as a fish out of water. So no doubt after discussing the beautiful in the company of Willis and Burnett in Rome and Paris the previous years, here Miller too must have found himself out of his element as well. And it's to his intellectual curiosity and great credit that Miller signed on with Stewart. But uh, dwindling gash, cash flow no doubt played a factor too. Miller would be Sir William's camera, recording the journey which Miller believed would be his last, owing to the fact that he was next in line to the baronetcy currently occupied by his ailing brother. Although American painters Catlin and Bodmer traveled to the American frontier around the same time, ultimately Miller is credited as the maker of the only on-the-spot watercolors of the Far West. Watercolor, before photography, was viewed as a means of documentation. Watercolor and field sketches outdoors were easy to set up, control, and put away, enabling quick and, and efficient images. Though seen as factual, they are filled with editorial choices. The sketches, which later Miller would duplicate in greater detail upon commission, resulted in the bounty of over 300 paintings in Miller's lifetime. And without any evident day-to-day -day journal of the 1837 Caravan West, Alfred Jacob Miller's subsequent rough drafts notes to Indian sketches, penned several years later, made for a valuable historical document of Western history. The Gilcrease collection includes nearly 166 notes with later poetic revisions. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Bernard DeVoto observes that in the main, Miller's rough draft notes is accepted as eyewitness testimony. And in the 1940s, Thomas Gilcrease began to assemble what would become one of the largest single collections of Miller's work, eventually comprising 45 oils, 77 watercolors, and two drawings. The majority of the watercolors purchased had once been part of the artist's studio collection. So it goes without saying how privileged I felt as to visit the vaults with my friend curator Laura Fry to personally review the uh, Gilcrease's collection of unframed Miller sketches, you know, much in the way that May Reed Porter first experienced them. She turned them over one by one by one, and we were just, again, we were astonished at the color of them. It was just, it was just a knockout of an experience. And following that same day, I spent time in the Helmerich Center at, under the supervision of Renee Harvey to view the notes later described, later edited into the great 1951 survey, the Walters Collection, the West of Alfred Jacob Miller, and that's his handwriting. Um, in his notes, Miller referred to Stewart as our commander, or our captain or our leader, who, who as commissioner naturally weighed in heavily with Miller on subject matter and potential scenes and sitters. Because the outfit was constantly in motion, Miller had to take his solitude where he can find it in order to get his work done. Of noonday rest, when the caravan halts to feed and rest, Miller observes that time was too valuable to indulge in the luxury. So he, des he describes his irritation that upon mounting the wagon with portfolio at the ready to go to work, our captain, who took a great interest in the matter, came up to me and said, you should sketch this and that thing. And Miller shot back, if I had half a dozen pair of hands, it could be done. And Stewart expressed his gratitude that Miller had not so many digits, owing to the high cost of the kid gloves it would take to manage him. In addition to safeguarding Miller's memorization of uh, favorite scenes, Stewart also found it necessary to protect his investment against the perils of poor judgment. Miller wrote that when the camp was settled, I gathered my sketching materials Oh, forgive me. Um, uh, I gathered my sketching materials and walked back in order to make a drawing. Selecting the best side of setting to work, being completely absorbed, about a half hour transpired when suddenly I found my head violently forced down and held in such a manner that it was impossible to turn right or left. An impression ran through my mind that this was an Indian that I was lost. In five minutes, however, the hands were removed. It was our commander, and he said, let this be a warning to you or else on one fine day you will be among the missing. You must have your eyes and wits about you. 
So when I asked my colleague why he held so fast to the idea of Stuart's same-sex orientation, he whispered, five minutes, really? So uh, the delicious little studio awaiting him in Scotland notwithstanding, Miller was not given preferential treatment by Stuart on the caravan to the far west. As Stuart enforced military discipline to the conduct of the company train, Miller had to take care of his own horses, but was allowed the single privilege to hire a substitute for night guard duty. Of Sioux Indian, Miller wrote that we selected this Indian not because he was a great warrior, chief, or brave, he was neither, but for the fact that his face pleased our fancy and bore an agreeable expression. And of the attempts of his grim old chief to dissuade the making of the sketch, the objections amounted to his not having distinguished himself in battle. Miller reported that it was refreshing to meet one Indian at least who had not stained his hands with human blood. He writes that his chin was smooth and as any woman's. A trapper explained that when the beard appeared, they pluck it out with an instrument made of bone, and eventually the germ of the hair is completely destroyed and it ceases to grow, giving somewhat of an effeminate appearance to their faces. Of finding Crow Indian Elkhorn uh, near Green River, Miller, Miller wrote that he differed from diff all others in one particular, being a free, rollicking, and laughter-loving savage, a kind of Indian Mark Tapley from Charles Dickens, always jolly and extremely good-natured. The trappers always welcomed him at the campfire for his continued gaiety and, and bonhomie. And of Antoine Clinette, Clement, which is, whose father was Canadian and his mother Indian, and one of the noblest spe specimens of a Western hunter, in the outward journey he killed for us about 120 buffalo. His temper, however, when roused was uncontrollable. Now, Sir William, too, was always noted for his violent temper, although, when outnumbered, was able to keep it, as well as save his hair in Sir William and the Crows. Scholar William Benjamin interprets the following as a lover's quarrel as reported by Miller's notes between Clement and Stewart on a morning hunting exhibition. Owing in some order that, some, that had been given and not attended to, the latter was somewhat of a martinet, would not tolerate for a moment and neglect or orders by a subordinate. Nevertheless, both were on perfectly equality, well-mounted, armed with matin rifles, and neither not knowing what fear was. It was a question of manhood, not social position, and I expected at every moment to see them level their rifles at each other. So Miller wonders just how he'll make it back to the caravan for aid in case they come to extremities. Extrem extremities. Just as things had reached a critical mass, as Providence would have it, a herd of buffalo was discovered at a distance. This was too much, Miller writes. The ruling passion overruled everything. And after that, off went Antoine at a mad gallop under whip and spur, and in a moment our captain followed. And the result was two no noble animals biting the dust, dust, each of the late belligerents, in great good humor and the subject of their quarrel entirely forgotten. In his notes for Crow Encampment, Miller is not above jesting about his captain, who once observed enjoying a, was observed enjoying a certain tomahawk, which was also outfitted as a pipe, which I didn't know that they were, but it was common, and this is one of the gill creases. Uh, three times a Crow native offered trades, each of, the in of increasing value, and Stuart refused. And the Crow warned, you better guard it or I'll steal it from you. And after three days, the pipe was gone. Although Stuart regretted the loss, he warranted that he had been given fair warning, and penciled in, later, in notes later, added in Miller's hand, no doubt he treasured the incident as a bomboche for an after-dinner narrative of his, old, of his return to old England. So Stuart was always kind of looking for stories to tell his friends when he got back home. The terrible doubt of appearances. So what is the scholar to do when confronted by suggestion of homosexuality to a broader narrative? Now a friend quite by accident recently tweeted this quote by Jose Esteban Munoz, Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer, which perfectly articulated my mission for this paper. Queerness has an especially vexed relationship to evidence. Historically, evidence of queerness has been used to penalize and discipline queer desires, connections, and acts. When the historian of queer experience attempts to document a queer past, there is often a gatekeeper, representing a straight past, who will labor to invalidate the historical fact of queer lives, present, past, and future. Queerness is rarely complemented by evidence, or at least by traditional understandings of the term. The key to queering evidence, and by that I mean the ways in which we prove queerness and read queerness, is by suturing it to the concept of ephemera. Think of ephemera as trace, the remains, the things that are left hanging in the air like a rumor. So for, for lack of a better term, this is where the phenomenon of, of gaydar sets in, or the putative ability of homosexuals to recognize one another intuitively, or by means of very slight indications. 
In David Deitcher's Dear Friends, American Photographs of Men Together, he weighs the emotional gamble of trusting one's good first impression of another while knowing how ill-founded such first impressions can ultimately prove. Deitcher labors to defend possible doubt of present about presenting nearly 100 affectionate, sentimental studio portraits of men together as if to say there's really nothing to see here, folks. But then he goes on to articulate the legitimate, quote, need to find community reflected back to us through historical artifacts when the past provides evidence of longing for the self-validation that results from having a history to refer to, longing for a comforting sense of a connection to others, past as well as present, whose experience mirrors our own. So when asked point blank if Gadar is a legitimate scholarly tool, a colleague, my friend Dennis McBride, director of the Nevada State Museum in Las Vegas and founder of the Nevada LGBT Archive, replied, damn straight. Uh, Walt Whitman addressed this anxiety of trusting one's first impression in Calamu's section of Leaves of Grass in his poem of the terrible doubt of, of appearances. Of the terrible doubt of appearances, of the uncertainty after all that after all, that we may be deluded, that maybe reliance and hope are but speculations after all, that maybe identity beyond the grave is a beautiful fable only, maybe the things I perceive, the animals, plants, men, hills, shining and flowing waters, the skies, day and night, colors, densities, forms, maybe these are, doubtless as they are, only apparitions, and the real something has yet to be known. But perhaps Whitman's poem might better serve the curatorial conundrum when faced with the inconvenience of the homosexual narrative. Whitman eclipses doubt with The Trapper's Bride, among Alfred Jacob Miller's most beloved works, uh, which inspired this famous passage in Walt Whitman's Song of Myself after he saw an ex a Miller exhibition in New York. I'll just read a brief portion of it. On a bank lounged the trapper. He was dressed mostly in skins. His luxurious beard and curls protected his neck. One hand rested on his rifle, and the other hand held firmly the wrist of the red girl. Alfred Jacob Miller, as a struggling artist residing in New Orleans, had no particular calling to visit the American West. Had Sir William Drummond Stewart suggested a tour of the Far East or the Nordic countries, Miller might have happily gone along if compensated to do so. Miller's mission was not to sell the American West, his manifest destiny, but to represent a sentimental, picturesque representation in order, uh, in accordance with his commissioner's requirements and desires. But Miller did accept Stewart's offer and challenge to accompany him to the Wind Rivers <coughs> Mountains in 1837. And here it seems that he was won over by his awe of landscape in this highly contemporary reminiscence of the jaded world traveler who feels he has seen it all. The tourist who journeys to Europe in search of a new sensation must, by this time, find that his vocation is nearly gone. Italy and its wonders have been described so often they begin to pale. Egypt, the River Nile, Cairo, and the pyramids have been done to death. Greece and her antiquities are as familiar as household words. Worlds, what will the enterprising do under these circumstances? Well, here's a new field for him. These mountain lakes have been waiting for him thousands of years and could afford to wait thousands of years longer, for now they are fresh and beautiful and just from the hands of the Creator. In all probability, when we saw them, not 20 white men ever stood at their borders, a single lake in Mont Blanc or wonders of Europe, but here are the mountains of lakes that, that reach from Tehuantepec to the frozen ocean in the north, or upwards 50 degrees, where nearly one-seventh part of the globe, ample room and verge enough, one would think, for a legion of tourists. So, in the 2018 Rendezvous, Wyoming's annual LGBT camping event, with over 500 residents as advertised, is an experience you'll never forget, to connecting with friends around the campfire, enjoying the crisp air and bright stars, cooking out, hiking, fun games and contests, connecting with friends old and new, and so much more. You'll have great memories of Rendezvous for years to come, and that's why so many people return to Rendezvous year after year. And my in response to my outreach to Wyoming equality uh, as to the 1987 origins of the rendezvous, President Sarah Burlingame stated that the original Chappers, Chapp, Trapper's Rendezvous is what started Wyoming equality. Wyoming equality did not start the rendezvous. In his rough draft notes on Indian sketches, Miller pretentiously writes that the work for the day being finished, they are at leisure, and if not too tired, get up for a dance while others chant or play the tune. So as for those Pesky dancing cowboys, as far back as 1837, Miller presently de sketched this image, trappers dancing around a campfire.
Thank you. I think we'll just move on. Thank you all so much. I'm going to hear some comments from Greg Hinton and then um, open it up for questions. Um, I'm a Wyoming kid, and uh, I left uh, many years ago kind of looking for safety and community uh, and companionship in the big city. And I felt really guilty about wanting to kind of reconnect with Wyoming because of what happened to Matt Shepard. And, um, uh, uh, and I have been back, back and forth quite a bit. And I was just there this past week because the University of Wyoming and the city of Laramie conducted um, a series of Matthew Shepard memorial events. Um, and I got to participate in one of them. But um, because we're in an art museum, uh, the, sh the way that Matt's mem memory is kept alive is through artistic responses to his life and the legacy of his parents. Some of you maybe have seen The Laramie Project, uh, which was uh, a play that uh, was conduct conducted by a playwright named Moises Kaufman in the Tectonic Theater Project in New York. They came 30 days after the murder, uh, a group of of, of students and, and, and Kaufman and asked permission to start interviewing the people of Laramie. And at first, Laramie was very offended, but they didn't have any way, any place to go with their feelings, so they agreed to start talking with them. And to this day, over uh, 30 million people have seen the Laramie Project. I'm going to direct it actually in a week at, in Missoula. So it's a wonderful vehicle if you haven't seen it. And then Michelle, of, of this film, we uh, screened it last year. Uh, at the Idle George Museum, uh, where Johanna is from, and uh, I asked Mrs. Shepard. Michelle was with us, and I asked if she could survive or, or surprise her with uh, with an introduction. And um, you know, basically, she she said nice things. But at the end of it, she said, "It's it's difficult for us to watch the film. We we have Matt with us again, smiling and laughing, and then he's gone." She wrote, Matt adored Michelle and trusted her, and she honored his film, his memory with this film. And she travels all over the world with the State Department and different human rights groups. I don't think she gets to do it anymore. But, uh, you know, she's always on the road with, with the whole body of this film, which, uh, which really just kind of tells uh, a wonderful story of their friendship and who, who Matt was. It's important that the for the shepherds that people not see him as a special kid. They, they want people to see him as an ordinary son, that uh, he was like anybody else, and this extraordinary thing happened to him. And that's what kind of makes the legacy of the Matthew Shepard Foundation so remarkable, because it's really true. Judy Shepard, who Dennis Shepard describes as, a, you know, a 15, you know, the highest rating of introvert that you could possibly find. She's a very shy woman, she's a small woman, and she's met, you know, with presidents and, and kings and movie stars, and she's truly the mother of, of the children, the young, young gay kids who come to her. She, 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 she's kind of on the front lines of, of hearing stories of, of how, how young LGBTQ kids are doing still, kind of uh, uh, sometimes mostly in rural, in rural areas, but also in, in progressive big cities as well. So I, um, I just want to, I, I won't, take our time here, but it, it's just remarkable to me that really it was 20 years ago at this very moment that the shepherds were dealing with the fact that their son had been murdered. Um, his, 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 his passing was announced by a friend, a new friend named Rulin Stacy, who was the uh, CEO of Poudre Valley Hospital, and uh, I did a, a kind of a stage reading of, of Rulin last week, and Dennis Shepard was there. And it was Rulin, Rulin was tasked to go out and, and kind of tell the world uh, that Matt Shepard had passed away. And, and he said something that Judy asked him to please remember to say, which is, go home and hug your kids and don't let a day go by without telling them that you love them. So with that, I think I'll stop. And if anybody have, has any questions about Matt's story or, or different artistic responses or what you can do or uh, just want to tell me how things are for, for uh, 
you know, the LGBTQ community in Oklahoma. I'd, maybe we could all talk about that for a few minutes if, if anybody has any ideas. Please. No, it's, uh, it's quite an accomplishment. Um, you may have noticed uh, Bishop, Bishop Gene Robinson, who was, I believe, the first, head of, the first gay man who was head of the Anglican Church. Um, and he and Judy Shepard have been friends for years. Um, the Shepherds have been very concerned that wherever, he, he was cremated, so they had his ashes, and, but wherever he's ultimately in, interred, that it be a safe, kind of welcoming space, which is hard to come by, um, given kind of how, how rough things are now. So uh, I literally had an email from Dennis yesterday, he didn't mention anything about it, and so it was just announced, and, and they feel, uh, again, I think it was in the works with Bishop Robinson, they just didn't feel that there, uh, that cathedral is protected, and so you can go and pay homage, but uh, it's not ever going to be an unwatched, unprotected space. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's really, really a, a beautiful asset of Washington, D.C. So that's where that came about. How, oh, please, Laura. Well, um, the uh, Matthew Shepard, uh, James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act was really a huge deal, and that happened about, I think it happened actually about 10, uh, nine or 10 years ago, and that was a huge, huge step. Uh, the difficulty is um, that in 29 states, there aren't local protections still, so I had no idea, you know, I've lived in Los Angeles in a bubble in the film industry for the last 40 years, and you know, me going back to Wyoming, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't have possibly conceived that I'd be turned away from, you know, running a Best Western room, you know, if my partner was standing next to me, or that people do, you know, can be fired if, uh, if for, for just being gay or be denied services and all that kind of thing. So I think that, uh, frankly, uh, I heard the Shepherds speak in Palm Springs a couple of weeks ago to a big journalist uh, convention and Judy was just asked how she's doing and she said, you know, after 20 years of this, I really thought that we could just retire and, you know, be quiet. And she said, and I just am so discouraged. She said, I, and I'm mad and we're just gonna keep going and going and going because, you know, uh, Matt's story wasn't that unique. What was unique about it is just that it lit, it was that spark that sometimes happens in history where, you know, if you remember, I don't know if anybody remembers first hearing about it, but, but Elton John and Ellen DeGeneres jumped on it immediately. And Rulin Stacy, who's the hospital administrator I was talking about, he was called back to the hospital. He says, well, why are you, uh, this happens, it's very sad, but he didn't understand why he was needed to kind of manage press. And in this, first it started with a couple of Fort Collins reporters. And then in two days later, Ted Kennedy was talking about it, you know, um, in the Capitol. And you had Elton John, and, and, and suddenly it, it was an international media event. Um, watching to see what was going to happen with Matt. And by the way, um, the, the shepherds were in uh, Saudi Arabia. That's where Dennis worked. So they got the call, and they had to wait 24 hours before they could get all the permits to get out, fly to Fort Collins, um, go to the Poudre Valley Hospital. Laramie couldn't take care of him. It was too extensive. And um, Matt was there all bandaged up, and he never, he never woke up. Um, and so Rulin was with them during those several days, and um, uh, 
you, uh, we've all probably sat, you know, at the bedside of somebody we love who's passing away, and you know how weird it is, like you have family and you're not always focused on that. You might be just talking naturally or watching a little TV and then, you know, your loved one's gone, and so that's what it was like for them. Um, but then after he passed away, they had the funeral, and that's when Fred Phelps um, uh, the, uh, of Westboro Ch Church uh, showed up in, in Casper and protested the funeral. I mean, they had all of these things that they had to navigate that were just unearthly. Um, and, uh, and cards and letters, and I, I, I visited them. Uh, I, I helped facilitate an LGBT archive at the American Heritage Center in Laramie, and I visited them in their home, and, you know, sh they have kind of like a basic basement, you know, there's a rec room over here, and here's the box goods from Walmart, and then a whole other set of racks or, or Matthew's papers and stuff. And they started, people, people started sending cards with money and, and a teddy bear, or um, people would say, this book helped me when my dad died, and maybe it will help you. And I mean, the love that came to them was... And they, they got organized instantly. Judy had a set of friends, a lawyer donated an office, who just started cataloging everything that came in. And, and those initial donations are what started the, the Matthew Shepard Foundation, which is in Denver and still going strong. But um, it was just that weird spark of history that, that happens. And, you know, uh, how tragic that it was their son, but uh, uh, how wonderful it is that they, that they just still are, are really going strong. So... Um, I don't, again, I don't, I don't know how Oklahoma, uh, you know, LGBT youth is, is fearing or faring, and I hope well, but uh, there's, there's just so much that we can do, and uh, I hope, uh, I hope uh, again, it's just really wonderful of the Gilcrease to have shown these, these clips and to host us and, you know, um, just to welcome us in, you know. Uh, my, my thing is, as we fight for our, our, our civil rights, let's, let's remember to partner, too, with history, and, and that's what we're doing here. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you.